Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, my very special guest is Carl, who is a listener of the show. Carl contacted me via email and expressed his thoughts on why he believes the current meme, which relegates the 1960s counterculture movement as nothing more than an engineered CIA Tavistock PSYOP, is simply an effort by the controllers to downplay and marginalize a very significant time in our history when the organic human spirit was breaking through the matrix. I asked Carl if he would come on the show to express his thoughts, and he accepted the invite. Carl is a child of the 60s, and to kick the show off, I asked him how he came to the conclusion that the 1960s was far more organic than how history is depicting it today. And here is what he had to say. Carl, how would you like to start? Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about why you came to this conclusion, why you think that the uh, the counterculture of the 1960s is being manipulated and how it's being revised to take on a flavor of being engineered. Mike's great to be here with you. And um, thanks for having me on. And um, I just want to say that I'm not an expert on the subject. Um, I'm, I'm an interested observer. I, I pay attention uh, to what's happening. And I, I, I did that from a young age. And I was there. I was there in the 60s. I was there at a young age. And I feel like I carry the, the spirit of the 60s still today. So... It was kind of with, uh, uh, I felt bad when I started to see, I, I looked with interest, but started to feel bad when I started to see some of the current uh, memes and, and, and interviews and books that are coming out online and uh, who questioning whether or not the 60s were a psyop, whether the, the music movement was controlled or even manufactured by the dark side. I had to do it. A, a reality check for myself it was a process and actually as I look back it seems like for the last three years or so but it seems to be growing and it seems to be moving towards the idea that it was manufactured uh, rather than simply controlled uh, I have long held actually myself that the counterculture and the music explosion of the 60s came organically out of we the people in accord with the times and then it was harshly set upon to squelch it okay so i know a lot of what we're hearing today probably i would say one of the major catalysts was dave mcgowan's book talking about laurel canyon yeah where dave goes into great detail about the music industry as an example and these bands that were being fired up coming out of laurel canyon as an example being the product of uh, the intelligence agencies like the cia and um, tavistock institute so how do you respond to that how do you respond to the dave mcgowan position that this is how it all came about it sort of was the first trigger for me of uh, what seems to be going on, which is an attempt to rewrite the history of the 60s, which I, I'm starting to consider a Mandela effect in progress. And the reason why it caught my eye was because it started to target folk rock, and which happens to be my favorite genre. It was it was so inspirational to me uh, as I was growing up, coming into my adolescence starting to become an adult that was sort of uh, the meat uh for me the messages that were in there and the beauty of the music uh another thing about that is is that the scene is described uh the laurel canyon of is part of los angeles area where a lot of the musicians in the mid to late 60s would gather they started gravitating up there and almost formed a bit of a community except that some a lot of the names of the people w were not really related frank zappa uh was anti-drug and anti uh, mind expansion uh, uh, through a chemical wouldn't allow his bandmates to use it either and uh well, for instance the doors they were not part of that scene the, the beach boys that was a different a different branch of music and so it wasn't a unified situation it, it was only unified by geography okay so i think what you're saying is is that clearly not all of these bands had these military ties these intelligence ties one of the main points of the book is that uh, jim morrison uh, his father was an admiral uh, in the gulf of tonkin when the vietnam war was uh, started 
uh, with that uh, supposed false flag. And, and you know, Stephen Stills was, uh, was, a, was from a military family. But, of course, I mean, you could pinpoint if, how many of them were in military intelligence. But, of course, we should note that this generation – uh, it's one of the things that's remarkable about this generation of mu- musicians is that a huge percentage of them were born during the war. And, of course, our nation and, and Britain, uh, where these uh, kids were born, everybody was in the military. So I'm not sure the case is being made or that they were actually brought into the, uh, the, the fledgling CIA and MK Ultra and M- MI6 and those uh, black ops that were just really getting off the ground after the war. Okay, okay. It's so, not clear to me at all that, that those kids were in those programs. So it sounds like perhaps uh, a position could be that it's guilt by association. So in other words, uh, Morrison's father was in the military. He was uh, involved in the Gulf of Tonkin. Zappa's uh, father was uh, in the military. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that, okay, so the, the parents were in the military. They may have been even high-ranking military officials. But that doesn't mean that Jim Morrison or Frank Zappa were, and I'm not intending a pun here, were taking marching orders. No. No, we can make a case that they weren't, actually. I mean, when we really look at the music that was coming out of there, the vibe of the music and the effect that it had, uh, we can start to make a case, which is where I want to go with this, that it was definitely not. We can make a case, not only is there only circumstantial evidence for it, but we can also make a case against it. Okay. Okay. And that needs to be done, and that's really why I'm here, because I'm here to look at it again for myself to see, am I a victim of this by proxy, or is, is, are we all being victimized by this rewrite? So I tend to believe that um, there was a lot of um, organic desire, movement, initiatives that took place, and it's very, very possible that once the intelligence agencies, and I'll call them the controllers, were seeing how this movement was moving in the direction it was going, that they look to see how it is they can take the navigation, take the reins from a particular point going forward, and seeing how they can steer it or how they can leverage it in order to uh, bring about outcomes that they're planning on based upon their strategy. Now, that doesn't mean that every single band was being steered or or that every single band could be steered, even if they were involved with people that were handlers and they perhaps didn't even know that people that were in their inner circle management, as an example, were in the positions of being handlers. To me, it gets a little dicey because to categorize it in a way that says that everything was co-opted, everything was engineered, that becomes a little difficult to believe. Yeah, and that should be a red flag, shouldn't it? Yeah, because guys like, as an example, Frank Zappa, to me, Zappa was one of the most anti-establishment musicians that ever lived. Yeah. And uh, so you'd have to step back and say to yourself, well, if, if Zappa were part of the uh, the orchestration, part of the engineering, that essentially he was placed in that position, that's what we'll hear a lot, that these people were placed into those positions, into that environment in order to foster an outcome, he didn't work out too well. Right. And and it's getting to the point, it seems like, in some of these uh, these discussions that are happening now, they're starting to pinpoint uh, the nodes where the, where the 60s counterculture came from, like Greenwich Village or Haight-Ashbury or Laurel Canyon. They're starting to target uh, movers and shakers out of the music scene, such as writers, producers, and, and others. Uh, that's where the rewrite is coming in, that they're starting to gather it all into one sort of CIA uh, black op kind of uh, operation. Would you take the position that today's music is very much engineered and orchestrated? I would. I would uh, state and take, make a case for the, a progression from the early days when, when, and, and when they started to corral things 
until now when things are very, very controlled. And we could parallel that even to the media or other areas, uh, general society. A lot of that's come out of the developments during World War II where technology and um, mind control techniques and all of this came, were, were, came out on a fast track. Uh, and uh, that's where we started to come into our modern um, control society. Yeah. So one of the questions the audience might be asking at this point, Carl, is, okay, so but you know, why would they even want to co-opt the history? Why go back and revise the movement yeah. of the 1960s? I believe that it is to disempower us. I believe that it is to basically take away our creations and say that they created them. And also to say that, look, they're, they're no good, and you're no good. Yeah. In a nutshell. And they can point to some of the new uh, music and, uh, and the videos, uh, uh, music, uh, uh, the, the, the rituals that are being done. And they can say, see, see how it is? Because it is all co-opted now. Not all. There's a, there's a, uh, an, uh, I could call it underground, but it's below the surface. The surface is completely controlled. The the big names. Yeah, there is no question about it. The big names right. today. There, yeah. there are independent. There are indie scenes, uh, with where there are still good music and good good music that's connecting to people's souls and that's feeding them. Uh, but but at the top. It, it is all controlled, and it's 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 putting out, uh, for lack of a better term, a satanic message. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree with that. And the one thing that I, I've always stated about the music from the 1960s, um, the 70s, and then comparing it to today is a lot of the music, I think that the music back then was, uh, there was much better craftsmanship. Um, there was much more talent behind the music. And if you listen to many of the bands back then, the message was uh, was very uplifting. Yes. You know, so it wasn't talking about doom and gloom. It wasn't talking about how to be a criminal. It wasn't talking about how to uh, abuse women and, and all the stuff that we hear in the music uh, today. I mean, a lot of the lyrics today are just incredibly, uh, they're very dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. So... In Laurel Canyon, you know, we had the likes of Joni Mitchell, uh, Neil Young, David Crosby, Stephen Stills, Graham Nash, Roger McGuinn, the Mamas yeah. and the Papas, right? Carol King, the Eagles. There's a lot of good music that came out of the list of bands I, I, I just named. Right, right. And I think some of the people, I get the feeling that some of the people who were kind of dissing that time and saying it was a psyop are some kind of conservative type people who just think that rock is the devil's music. That was the establishment that was saying that back yeah. then, but now it's certain truthers who are sort of maybe unwittingly giving in to their own bias as saying, gosh, it's too bad folk music died and uh, and uh, that we weren't um, uh, doing all a certain kind of social conscious, socially conscious actions back then that we that we succumb to being hippies and uh, sitting around gazing at our navels and having drum circles instead of doing something. I've heard all of those things uh, over the years uh, as far as throwing rocks yeah, at the 1960s, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I'm here to d defend the hippies too because because I am one and I know uh, hippies and I know the legacy of the hippies which I hope we will get to but uh, I like the track you're following now and uh Pray continue. Okay, so Carl, what about giving the audience, because some of the audience may be completely unaware of what the 1960s were about. I mean, there's going to be folks my age and your age, they're going to know, they're going to get it, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, if they're paying attention. But we're going to have folks that are 20, 30, maybe 40 years old, and all they know about the 1960s is exactly what, what you're saying, is you know the revised perspective or the revised history of the 60s. You were a product of the 1960s. You were there. So what was the 1960s about, for those that don't know? Well, they were a very exciting time, and I think that, of course, every generation, as it comes into its adolescence, has a feeling of excitement, hope, and forward-looking, and, and they have their own music and all of this. But it was obvious even to me at a young age that there was it was a it was a, a especially um, a big time, and I should say here that um, now is also a big time. So if you want to feel 
uh, in a way what it's like. Uh, it's a little like now, and there should be some parallels that I hope we'll get to make. To create the framework for the counterculture and uh, the music of the counterculture, we need to look at the entire decade, and I agree with that, and we can do that to, as as uh, to boil it down, we, I think we. I, I, I've been thinking about it, and really, it was a uh, it was a 20 year decade. Really, it rose up in the mid 50s with the civil rights movement led the way, and there was a, a rock and roll explosion with uh, where rockabilly and uh, rhythm and blues started coming up. Elvis and uh, and many many others. And it lasted until the mid 70s when it started. It dragged down as it was overweighted with the psyops that were being piled onto it, drugs uh, and uh, control of the music business and everything else. Every year in the 60s itself was was like a different year, and it is like a child growing up. Where when you're five, you're you're one way, and when you're six, you're like a different person. And so 1967 was very different from 1968, which was very different from 1969. But it, to start with, it was a very, very different time. And I just want to give a couple of examples. Children were allowed to roam. As kids, we could freely rove the streets and the lots and the alleys. We could go for miles at age under 10 and uh, as long as there was daylight. And and th these were responsible adults that were allowing us to do this because the streets were safe and there was still a feeling of freedom. And uh, and also, uh, my friends and I were able to carry our toy rifles like a squad of soldiers on patrol down the sidewalk, past the shops, on our way to the woods to play war on the outskirts of New York City. You can hardly imagine that now. Okay, now another thing is is that the, the tangible thing that did we we need to give the gives a feeling of the decade is up through nineteen sixty four everybody had real silver in their pockets. And real silver, if you've ever felt it, has a sort of jingle to it that's unlike the copper sandwich coins that came in later. They've changed the metal several times. Now this is we're talking a little bit on a metaphysical level, but it's it's actually a, a, a an example of a kind of integrity that was built into the system still. Not only that, but of course prices were lower, uh, and a silver nickel could buy you a candy bar then, and a comic book cost twelve cents. And there were a lot of other things that were intrinsic that are not now, like there was no GMO corn syrup in the soda. And the sky was blue, not streaked with chemtrails. And there was nobody looking at their phones because there was no mobile phones. So just picture that. Now we have all sorts of fears, fears of government, fears of terrorism, fears of being broke, not having a job, not being able to pay off your student loan, whatever. The main fear then was that the Russians were coming. And I remember being told as a child that the world was going to end Saturday. And I looked it up recently. It must have been Saturday, October 27th, 1962, the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The 60s sported three contentious presidential elections, including the first one with Kennedy, where my dad told me some a few years later, still in the 60s, that there were some shenanigans with the Chicago vote. And uh, so there was already ideas about uh, fixing an election back then. But uh, there was also an escalating and endless war in Southeast Asia and at least four high-profile assassinations of national leaders. Ole Damagard gave you a great interview about what really happened with uh, Martin Luther King in 68. Right. So uh, to boil it down quickly, there were movements and sub-movements. There was not just the rock and roll and the hippies. There was an immense civil rights movement, which was already 10 years old by the mid-60s, and very many people involved and a lot of violence. It's hard to believe that there was a Ku Klux Klan uh, still uh, stringing people up, but that was the case. There was also a offshoot a national nation of Islam, which had some contention on how that civil rights movement was, should go. Uh, it 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 changed course pretty radically after Malcolm X was killed, 
And then there was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, another big movement uh, which was broken up violently by the FBI as well. Uh, there was a women's lib movement, a second wave of feminism that was getting strong uh, with people like Betty Friedland and Gloria Steinem. And there was an American Indian movement, which it's hard to believe all this was going on at the same time, but uh, the American Indian movement held Alcatraz Island for 19 months in 1969. And there was a wounded knee standoff in 73. It was it was quite something. As far as the counterculture, there were the hippies. And then there were yippies. There was a radical arm with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin that ended up with the Chicago 7 trial after the Democratic Convention in 68. And there was a uh, SDS, Students for Democratic Society and Weather Underground. And there was an ecology movement starting, too. Um, but the, the the big dichotomy was because all of these actually had the same goals, which was uh, justice and equality, peace even, even the, the radical ones, and uh, est- establishing or holding the, the U.S. government to the Constitution, claim the rights that should have been uh, uh, granted or, or, or were granted or were represented there. Now how do you but respond they, to something like the weather on the ground, though, where, I mean, they, you know, they were involved in very violent bombings and, and those types of things? I mean, I don't uh, I don't subscribe to that. I, I was uh, I was in in junior, junior high or high when in when 68 when Mark Rudd took over part of Columbia University and was, I had to go right past there from my school and um, we saw them throwing furniture out the windows and the police were lined up on horses a block long just uh, surrounding the place I don't agree with that do you believe people like Rudd and maybe uh, even Abby Hoffman as an example with uh, part of the yippie movement because Hoffman was um, he had ties to John Lennon I guess the point I'm trying to make Carl is that do you believe people like Abby Hoffman and uh, Mark Rudd possibly had ties into intelligence into the CIA anything is possible any any person could have ties into that I'm not going to defend any individual no I'm just the reason why I'm asking is because there are going to be people that are going to be listening to this and they're going to pick apart people like Mark Rudd and Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and say that um, at the end of the day, they were controlled opposition. Yeah. That they took what may have been, may have started as a good thing and they manipulated it so that in the end, it was something that wasn't a good thing. Well, how well, do you yeah. respond to something like that? The government felt very threatened by all of this. They were peaceful, like Martin Luther King, that was a, uh, uh, totally against violence. And then there were others who were advocating it. But it was all for the same end, which was the peace, uh, the, the justice, the rights, uh, and, and those, those human rights that we needed. Yeah, they set upon it like rabidly in every way that they could. They set upon it with the government did with violence, with subterfuge, with it, with they, it was a multi-pronged attack. They're into controlled opposition and yeah. all of that. You know, in the 1960s, I remember a much simpler life. And some people will say that's because you didn't know then, Mike, what you know now. <laughs> but I, I do remember, as an example, Carl, that. My father went to work and mom stayed home. So she attended to the to the family needs. We had uh, a pretty nice house out in New York on Long Island. We were blue collar, but I remember doing the same things that you said about being with my buddies and we'd have our toy guns and we'd be playing army in the woods. And I remember my parents knowing that we were out the whole day, maybe down at the schoolyard playing ball, whatever, and we would come home for, for dinner. And um, it, it was... A safer time. I, I don't care what anybody says, but you, you can't do this stuff today. If you try to do this stuff today, in other words, if you try to allow your kids to be outside uh, a confined area, you run the risk that somebody's going to turn you in and social services is going to turn up at your door. That didn't happen back when you and I were kids. No. It was a different era and it was a lot freer. To finish up on that part, there there was a great dichotomy. There was a uh, there was a uh, schism, but because um, as the counterculture started to rise, so did the war in Vietnam, and so by by 
I guess we're focusing a little more now. Uh, by 67, the sun, which, which people call the summer of love, that love energy was matched by uh, half a million U.S. troops fighting, which was – that was palpable. Right, and they had the body counts, remember, in the evening on the news? Yeah, yeah. In Vietnam? <laughs> That Walter was Cronkite a... was 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 partially responsible, in my opinion, for ending the war because he he just at one point got fed up and just started putting it on every every night. The the actual photos, so you the the footage, you, you they don't do that anymore. It's no. all not not televised. Now it's basically they, yeah. they bring it to you like it's some kind of uh, entertainment has entertainment yeah. value for people, right? Yeah. But I remember very clearly back then, um, and I was a young boy, but my father would watch the news at night, and I remember the uh, they would go through the body count of how many soldiers were killed in Vietnam. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. put tremendous pressure on on the, yeah. the, the controllers and the, the controlling apparatus. Um, yeah, yeah. Know, right? You won't see that today. No, no. And then that came out like you started to see the atrocities, like the My Lai massacre. And right. It, the, and there were newsmen getting killed. It was it was real. Yeah, that helped end it. And even at a young age, there was something in me that resonated. And I want to get into this too because I felt programmed for it. And programmed is a is a is a is a bad word now. But I felt like almost like karmically I was born for this, and I could understand it as I as I was even too young to participate. And I was saying, "Oh man, this is the greatest thing. We are going to have a great, great world." And and I was so disappointed when it ended. I was just and there are a lot of people. You go on some of the uh, videos on YouTube of of some of the old concerts and things like that. And there's comment after comment is like, "What a great time! That was real music. Uh, I wish I was alive then." Or other guys saying, "Yeah, like, oh man, that was the best time. I, I, I'm so glad I was there." Yeah. And that's how I feel. I feel I feel privileged. I feel lucky. I feel uh, glad. That I was that I I was there when that those amazing records were coming out week after week, blowing our minds because music was progressing. It was uh, once we got like '65 was like a bang year where things started to uh, the the artists started to be mature enough. The music started to grow in leaps and bounds, like George Martin was saying with the Beatles. He wasn't that impressed when uh, they came in with "Love Me Do" the first time, the first session. He wasn't that impressed, but he saw something in those lads. But he 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 was his mind was blown because as it, they, they, st they started to bring in a more and more sophisticated material, and he was impressed himself. And then that's what you started to see. And we who were receiving it, all the stuff that's on classic rock was like coming out weekly. And, and new genres were being invented, like folk became folk rock, and then blues rock, and jazz rock, and country rock. Those were all invented in front of our eyes. Yeah, it was an amazing time as far as the, the output of uh, creativity with the music. I remember Jimi Hendrix his first album are you experienced and that was just unbelievable yeah 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 what well, purple haze i think is considered one of the greatest debut singles of, of all yeah yeah you could tell that impressed a lot of musicians they that that's how you know it's good because it starts to influence these people start to influence each other right yeah there was the music and then there there was uh coming out through fm radio fm radio which is being attacked for being a delivery system of the of the dark side but but we were there like baby birds being fed and i see it as good it feels good in me it had a good uh uh, uh effect on others um, we, it was not an information age. It was very much like almost underground where we, we had to listen late at night and, and the magazines and there was no internet. You know, the album covers and the lyrics, we'd go to the store and read the magazines or buy them and look at the lyrics. It was all very important, uh, what was happening. There were messages in it and there was, uh, souls being fed by those, those tunes. And yeah. so that's where the hippie movement came out of. I'm really, it came out of some anti-war, some of the the beatnik bohemian past, but a lot of it came right out of the music. I feel I've been thinking about it lately, and the the two are really married. The hippies and the rock music are married. 
I'm going down memory lane right now, and I'm thinking back to the 60s and into the 1970s when I was a kid. I know we kind of covered this a little bit, but I'm comparing it to today. And it's so, so different than it, it is today. And, uh, and I know you're going to get into this, but at some point, this degree of creativity, this expression through music as an example, was wrestled to the ground and it was commandeered at some point. Because we don't have this level of creativity coming out of bands today for the most part. I'm talking about the bands that most people are going to hear on the radio. I know there's uh, indie uh, labels and there's independent bands and, and all that. We had great music on the radio. And I remember listening to uh, the songs uh, to radio stations on AM. And then, by the way, I loved FM. We started getting those FM stations. Uh, just the clarity alone on, on the music was, was incredible. I know I'm digressing a little bit here, but... I, as you're speaking, I'm just taking a trip down memory lane. Yeah, yeah. And I'm remembering how very, very different it is. And and so, you know, so I think that that lends credence to your argument, which says, and you know what, this wasn't all controlled and engineered and orchestrated from the beginning, because if it were, it wasn't such a bad thing. But <laughs> it, it, that's like that's like what John Lennon said was says that the C, I don't know if he used the word CIA, but he says they gave us the LSD to try to bring us down, but it actually opened our minds, and that's how things work. Sometimes they work backwards from what they think it's going to be. But it's changed a lot, right? And I, oh. I know we're going to get into it. Right, and, uh, right, right. Uh, hopefully, people today who weren't there can um, make get that context that we're trying to provide. And how about? Things like attire, the way people dressed. Yeah, the world that was being created at that time, uh, which I would say was by us, um, which they, the day, the dark side hated and tried to bring down quickly, was uh, full of love, higher consciousness, freedom of expression, uh, the joy of a child, bliss, acceptance, tolerance, inclusiveness, cooperation, sharing, and openness. Those are some words I wrote down. But part of that was, you know, the, the fashion was that you were free, was important then, free to wear whatever you wanted to wear. And people wore everything from history, from, uh, you know, the Navy, they took bell bottoms and pea coats, and uh, aviate, from the Air Force, they took, you know, aviator jackets and aviator glasses. But they want you, you, anything you find um, from uh, retro shops, vintage clothing, um, uh, frontier clothes. I mean, when 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 Buffalo Springfield came out and they were wearing buckskin, I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Not because I'm so into mountain men, but it was just this freedom. It was like an art form to wear your clothes. Yeah, I was always fascinated by the uh, by the attire in the 1960s, especially when it got into the psychedelic era. Yeah. It was very expressive. Uh, and it was fun. It was fun, yeah. It really was. I remember, um, of course, I know you know this, but you remember laughing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, today, it would never fly. You would never see yeah. it on TV today. Well, there was something very naturalistic about it, and um, that was really uh, what I'm thinking back on it. It's the natural, where men grew their hair out, and, 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 and it was, you know, you didn't have to... You, you know, you, you didn't you didn't try to be all buttoned down. Uh, it was part of the getting away from the direction the country was going in, which is the uh, straight laced and that kind of thing. But um, the naturalistic, I I see that as a, almost a counteraction to the machine, which is being put into place now. So there's a sort of a, a, a naturalistic movement, and it even harkens back to the Native Americans where there was this um, push to eradicate that all which was uh, um, indigenous. And that's a lot of the hippies had to do, were very parallel. People thought, oh, they're flaky, they're dirty, and that's exactly what they were saying about Indians 100 years earlier. But it was a naturalistic movement that I personally felt very uh, akin to, and still I do. I'm a country boy, even though I was raised in the city. And, and, and I think there's a case to be made, because there are even urban country people. It, it's a mindset, not, not where you're at in terms of how many trees and grass there is where you are. It's, it's a natural man that was, that was being championed that was coming out at that time. 
as you said, there was a lot of creativity and there was a lot of freedom of expression which sprouted out of the 1960s. And it was all over the place. And today, we take a look around us, even though people like to think that they're expressing themselves, it's very cookie cutter. <laughs> yeah, it's very limited. Yeah. It's a Coke or Pepsi world. Yeah, and it just wasn't like that back then. Uh, yeah, there was there was more experimentation and uh, and and mind expansion for new perspective. It was kind of like pushing out of the box at that time. So you know the question of whether it was all a setup, whether it was a think tank program, uh, whether it was designed to kill the American way, which has uh, you know been levied at it uh, to kill the family. You know, free sex. We're not into the nuclear family to make us decadent and weak or whether it was an early step in the current uh, apparent demolition of the Western world that's in swing right now. Those are the kind of things that, that, that I think is in people's minds who are uh, criticizing it now and, 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 in fact, rewriting history. I'm not sure how that's really happening, Why, whether those memes are being put in by another PSYOP or whether – it's just a product of where we're at, where people are waking up and they're suspicious of everything and they're trying to put a false flag label on everything. I'm not sure where that all comes from. Yeah, I think that uh, what happens is is we do have uh, elements which are, are trying to uh, co-opt, commandeer, manipulate movements, whether it be the music scene, fashion, whatever. But I, I do believe that there was just so much of it in the 1960s. Not, I don't mean so much control or orchestration. There was so much creativity and freedom of expression that it would be very difficult to try to corral that. Um, that's why I think it took many, many years for them to whittle it down to where they've got it today. Yeah. And yet there is another streak going through it that we can grasp. For, and I think we'll get to that. It's the legacy of the 60s, and it is also that which resonates with now, which points to a similar kind of approach or solution for us. But we'll, we'll get to that. Looking at the music, though, again, I just want to uh, w at least once more revisit the incredibleness of it and look at uh, some figures that actually became leaders of the uh, counterculture, which is the Beatles, Dylan, and the Stones. Now, you know that there are going to be people that are going to say all three of those bands were created by, they were Tavistock products. That's why I'm naming them, because they were so central, of course they would be attacked, or, or, or those, those that would be, so that's why I want to look at them. I don't okay. want to look at them. I want to defend them, but I also want to do it open-mindedly because I'm a truth for myself. I'm not here to blindly defend anything at all. I, I want to know if I've been fooled. So what would you say about Bob Dylan as an example, whose real name is Robert Zimmerman, right? Yeah. Um, so he had, he had an alias, which is fine. A lot of bands and right. a lot of performers do that. So why do you think that Dylan was not part of the, the engineering I would first begin by saying that the Beatles and Dylan were almost equal, I think, in their influence of 60s music and the mindset of the hippies. And the Stones were just a little bit behind them. But that there are scores of others who we could say the same things about, which is that they were either controlled or they were tapping into something or there was something happening with them that we could look at. But but again, we're going to focus on Dylan here. And I know there's, for instance, uh, a, uh, a, a, a viral uh, video where he's talking with uh, Ed Bradley. Is that his name? For yeah, Ed Bradley. Minutes? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Where uh, he, he, he alludes but doesn't say anything. Um, but he did say that he made a bargain. He right. did say that he's trying to hold up his end of the bargain. And then they had, Ed Bradley was astute. He asked him, can I ask who, who the bargain is with? And Dylan says it's, it's something like the Lord of this this world and beyond, or the, the this world and the next Yeah, one. unseen, yeah, like an unseen force type of thing. He was sounded like, I, I watched that video, so it sounded like he yeah, was Yeah, Dylan about. is very enigmatic and uh, hasn't given a lot of interviews over the years and so forth. But, uh, for instance, if he sold his soul, what did he get? You know, he, he actually... 
he he's highly thought of, but his 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 stock seems to be going down. Um, I don't know if he'll get that big of a accolade after he's gone. I mean, he should. He was a giant, but yeah. I'm not sure that he uh, is recognized as such anymore. And you know, he really didn't sell that many records. He has a lot of influence, and he got a lot of glory, but he also got a lot of criticism and a lot of had a lot of sort of fallow ground in his life. He didn't really have that great of a life like, let's say, um, Beyonce or somebody like that, where they're really getting all the riches and 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 uh, and the fame. The other thing is that, you know, he said that, but he he sounded like he had made that when he was a young man uh, to be where to get where I am now or something like that. He said. But you know, he 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 had a Christian phase where he were, he did like three or four albums where he did nothing but praise the Lord. I remember that. Yep. So how do you square that with it? But the real thing is is what was his effect? His effect on millions was wholly beneficial. His poetry, his um, groundbreaking, pioneering whatever came through him we can i'd like to discuss what what is this that comes through somebody because it could be a good uh, alternative to uh what comes through you as cia programming we got to see what else it could be but what came through him was magnificent and uh, i'm here to say that uh the dark side does not produce magnificence Evil cannot produce good, and we can we can uh, try to make a case for whether it was good or what is good. How do you define it? But I'm just saying, good is what promotes well-being in others. Let's just say, and uh, that that it, it, he qualifies. He qualifies in spades. His music resonates through me, and I know many others. It actually lives in us. He was uh, very inspirational for many many people. If he influenced the Beatles. Yeah, well, that's how the Beatles wound up writing a lot of the material for uh, Rubber Soul. That's uh, right. Very influenced by Dylan. To me, I'll give you my view on this. I mean, I, I think it's a um, it's a very complex picture. And I say it's complex because I believe that there are handlers, there are people that are plugged into these big acts. So in other words, if you become big enough, then you get a lot of attention. And that attention could amount to uh, trying to at least be steered. Now, that doesn't mean that the person that's writing the songs or is in the band is going along with some kind of program. It, it just says that there are influences around that artist. Now, I will say today, I think it's very different. I think many of these artists today are very well aware of what they're plugged into. Yeah. Okay. But I think back then, maybe not, because... Like you, when I listen to the songs, many of those songs, they're talking about, they're singing about love. They're talking about coming together. They're talking about, they're singing about being good to each other. Yeah. You know, right? So when you, when you listen to the songs and you get the themes of what it is they're singing about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a sour note. It's, it's not dark. It's not empty. Whereas yeah. today I could point to a lot of music and say that should not be playing on anybody's radio, should not be playing in anybody's car. You should be not buying these CDs. That's just me. And some yeah. people are just going to say, I'm just an old guy spouting off. But you know, be that as it may. And that's why we're talking about this, because the 1960s, it was a completely different era, especially from a music perspective. I and mean, there's a lot of things that were very different. But for the folks listening to this, and if you're younger than Carl and I, go back and go listen to some 1960s records and CDs and take a listen. And you tell me whether... You don't hear a difference in how the music was constructed and, in particular, the message. Yeah. Now I'm going to get metaphysical. It has a shine or a brightness um, or um, um, for the words. Now, I'm not talking about music being upbeat. I'm talking about um, the. you could say it's part of what makes it appealing even now. It's timeless, and it has a certain um, – it emanates light. I mean, if that's poetic, and if you go, if you don't get that, maybe it, it's not part of the case to be made. But to keep things going parallel, the idea of the natural man and woman that yeah. was at the heart of the movement and was part of the message of the music. You look at the uh, the, the natural man and woman is the 
Again, the, the, the basic, nat- when you talk about natural rights today, when you talk about getting back to the garden, those are not literal, not getting back and growing vegetables, although it can be, but it has to do like uh, with Aretha Franklin was singing You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, written by Carol King and Jerry Goffin. But uh, at its base, the counterculture was a bid to return to the natural man. And this was something that the establishment didn't want, and they don't want it now either. So there's a, we're going to start to get to a parallel here when we get a little further here. But being yourself, having freedom, enjoying yourself and experimenting, those are back-to-the-garden kind of things. People were reading Thoreau, Emerson, Ruskin, John Muir during the 60s. Uh, things like organic and loving the earth. These are things getting into tribal dance and trance dance. Now, some people are saying today, you know, trance dance, you got to really, that's not too cool because we have to be alert. There's a, a backlash now to all of the programming that we're starting to come out of, and we're starting to be suspicious of things like that. But uh, even tribal, even things like getting together, is being uh, uh, part of the the critique that's that's being levied here, but I I, I want to make a case that that is that there is such a thing as individualism, uh, uh, and there's also being uh, but not separate. I mean, it was part of something because we did feel like part of something, and it was sort of um, getting back to basics, um, and it was also about getting high which was a high vibration, which was a raising of consciousness. So there was love and consciousness in that movement. And uh, part of that was also through the shamanic use of drugs, which um, when, when I first got into drugs, it was for that purpose. And the people that I was around... It was for that purpose, and that can be forgotten. Right now, it's starting to come back in a little bit with the ayahuasca ceremonies. Yeah. And I know this is a controversial subject because there are a lot of people who have a lot of strong opinions one way or the other about it, but I'm just speaking of it as part and parcel to that whole movement, which it really was. So there was a spiritual sacred side to it, a sacramental use for the purpose of expanding one's mind to open doors of perception, to see into ourselves, to know ourselves, and to see reality with new eyes. So it was a sort of a tool for awakening, and I'm sure people who are awakening can, can, can track with that, but they may say, oh, you don't need it. No, you don't need that. But it can be used as a tool, even though, of course, probably the best highs are natural highs, for sure. I'm not going to tell people what to do. But I was uh, like saying, yeah, you know, I can't wait till I'm old enough to try some. And it was for that purpose. So these 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 drugs are like uh, Carlos Castaneda was coming in there at that time, and the drugs as the teacher, the plant or the compound as a teacher was an idea then. And then there was medicinal and recreational aspects sometimes too. Um, but then there was that power that was behind it, and this has to do with what the CIA and others have started to do after that, because they started to make it, uh, so because it's such a powerful substance, those substances can become habitual, they can become addictive, and they can become pathological. So anything that's of a power is going to be tried to be subverted, and uh, it's it's a natural thing for people to have that happen too. So it takes a lot of discipline on our part. I'm not saying everybody was perfect then, and just like the musicians, we were all just um, kind of winging it, but our heart was in the right place. It's very um, very constrained today, very contained, very controlled. And you made an interesting point today. There's a lot of talk about people going to ayahuasca ceremonies. Yeah. You know, so it's it's almost like there is kind of this uh, breaking out where people are veering off and circling back to a point in time, the 1960s as an example, where uh, these same types of uh, experimenting and experiences were taking place. Yeah. There's no better song to summarize what that uh, natural movement was was than Woodstock by Joni Mitchell. And just the name of it contains two of the buzzwords that are in the uh, memes that are 
that are proliferating today on the internet. Woodstock is being uh, called a, a, a government program where LSD was spread and certain performers felt like demons on the stage and so forth. And Joni Mitchell, of course, is archetypal of the Laurel Canyon scene. So I just want to quick uh, go through some of these lyrics, which are uh, which tell actually compresses the movement into one song. Uh, she talks about she, she she didn't make it there. She was so chagrined that she uh, was at a concert and tried to fly there and then got stuck in New York City. But she wrote this song based on what she got out of it, the feeling. So she came, she came, she comes upon a child of God. A child of God now is not a child of the government, and it is a natural person and who who is living by natural law. This should resonate with people today, truthers who are looking to get back to what we are, and tells how he was. Uh, she came upon this child of God, finds out what he's doing. He's going to a farm. He's going to join a rock and roll band. He's going to camp out on the land. We're talking about the earth here. We're talking about the music. And he's going to try to get his soul free. That's what we were doing. And then she goes on to make a big picture. We are stardust. We are golden. This is what the flat earthers are saying now. We are not just little specks. We're something. Uh, we are stardust. We are golden. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Back to the basics, back to who we are and what, what, you know, who we are. And then she goes on to say we've come to lose the smog. Now that's a, a, a word about what we're leaving. The, the middle class, the, the, the little boxes made of ticky tacky and the rat race. Uh, we're leaving that. And I feel to be a cog in something turning. This could be poison to some of the people today, but they need to understand that there are negative ways to be part of something that's bigger than you, and to be a mind-controlled slave, for instance. And then there's a, a positive thing to be part of, which is like the cosmos and the shifting of the ages and God. So she says that. She says, well, maybe it's the time of year, or maybe it's the time of man. I don't know who I am, but life is for learning. That's profound. That's what we were doing. Yeah. And um, see if there's anything else. Yeah, we came together. We were half a million strong, very powerful. We, there was a song and celebration, and the bombers were turning into butterflies. That's not just wishful thinking. It's not just uh, pie in the sky, la la land. Everything's fine. I'm a new ager. All I got to do is stay positive. No, it's intention, and it's a beautiful dream. It's a vision. But we're doing something. We're getting together. We're getting back to the garden. We're a billion year old carbon. That's again another way of saying that we're something because um, it makes us eternal, and that we're 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 caught in the devil's bargain. The devil's bargain is the life that we're it's the slave life that we're going to be making a new society from. So then it was all beset by the dark, which is uh, some things we can go into here. But how it was dragged down is the issue. Um, we uh they 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 set upon sex drugs and rock and roll which are high octane stimulants which are actually medicine and they uh they can be these these can be made into control agents as well uh they can because they are avenues into people and they 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 are they are powerful they can be uh, those are the things those things are targets and uh they are shamanic portals and they it can be used to experience the beyond and to understand ourselves. And it's understandable why they would want to muddy and poison them. And I made an analogy uh, of an enemy controlling the water holes in a desert, as the U.S. Army did to the Apaches here in the area where I am in the southwest. Uh, the portals of life, they want to control those. Yeah. So sex represents life force and love. Drugs represent mind expansion and consciousness and music is the i think the prime river or channel of communication yeah well the music is frequency right i mean yeah. so right that's right. how the tribes did it the indigenous tribes a lot through through right. or, oral stories and through music tr trance dancing and so forth uh to keep their culture alive 
So yeah. they uh, each of those, I mean, they brought in, the U.S. government brought in hard drugs. Uh, they even shipped to, <laughs> they, they, if people don't know it now, they should, that the government is actually a drug dealer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and right. they brought in harder drugs into the music business. I mean, you you could look it up yourself. Of all of our uh, uh, of of all the musicians, the different musicians that have fallen prey to those and had a hard time coming out, and it does dampen the creative spirit when you take too much of that kind of stuff. And the music business was slowly or quickly taken over by the money people. They said, "Oh, we, you know, we can make money here." And they, they, um, for any, everything from managers to promoters to record companies sewed it all up. And now it's all uh, the biggest stars are controlled or manufactured. But it's what's interesting is also something that I watched. that's more subtle. It's a move, the move towards digitalization, which is so embraced as great technology. I actually uh, rude that change when the CDs took over from the LPs because I felt as though we were analog, we were not digital, and they were sort of uh, disassociating ourselves from the source. And actually, in the 80s, uh, actually it was later, I, I stopped buying after they, we couldn't get LPs anymore for the records I wanted. But early in the 90s, uh, Somebody I work for, my boss, he had some sound system and some records and, and, and stuff, and I asked him if he, if I could do a, a, a test, and I actually sat there with earphones for, uh, headphones for like an hour or two, listening to the same record, and he didn't actually have CD of it, but he had a, a tape, a cassette tape versus a CD, and I can't say it was a blind test because I was doing it myself, he wasn't there, but uh, I could tell the difference of a fuller sound versus a drier bitness, I call it a bitness, like it was all in bits, replacing the fuller sound um, of the music. I would agree with that. I have a large vinyl collection, Carl, and um, the CDs are very sterile. It's nothing like when you place that needle down on yeah. on, on an LP, and yeah. just, there's a warmth that emanates from the sound. I can definitely hear it. I mean, I can I have a CD of of a particular album, and I have the the vinyl, and if I play them side by side, it's very apparent to me that the vinyl is just a much more, like I said, it's it's there's a warmth. It makes you relax more. It, you just get more into the uh, into the music. Versus it being this digital, sterile sound that's just pulsing into your ears, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I think, I'm pretty sure there's been a, a further audio shrinkage from the compression to the Walkmans and the audio files that most people are listening to now. Yeah, everything's compressed today. Everything's and so compressed. that, in effect, in effect, has actually been a rewrite of the history of the music because when you listen to Sgt. Pepper's, when I listened to it in summer of 67, over and over and over again on my uh, uh, turntable, that, that's not what people are hearing now. Yeah, in fact, there's a story, talking about the Beatles, there's a story uh, when they recorded the White Album that uh, the engineers started to compress the album. And George Harrison happened to walk into the studio. He said, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and he told him to stop it immediately. Yeah. I mean, I also rude all the, rude the day when they um, began with the drum machine loops and uh, the voice correction and all the other electronic technology that just was, to me, adding distance to the whole thing. Everything in the vocals today are all autocorrect. Yeah. That's why the vocals sometimes sound very shrilly. It's a mess today. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, just, it's, a, it's a mess. Right. And then there's another thing that I just found out about, which I was looking at uh, something called Hertz, where uh, there oh, was yeah. there was a 400. I don't understand how that works, but 432 Hertz, yeah. known as Verdi's A, right. which was a, a healthy vibration that was mathematically in tune with the universe, was changed to 440 Hertz, apparently in Germany and during the war by Goebbels. Uh, to make people more aggressive. And in 1950, apparently, it was adopted widely as the industry standard. Oh, and it, it is the standard today. So when uh, I'm a musician, so when we tune up, uh, it's 440. Like you buy an electric piano, it's tuned to 440. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you get 432, supposedly, because I've done the same research as you, that is something that, um, that's a frequency that resonates with human beings. 
Yeah, yeah it, it definitely was changed. It was definitely went from 432 <laughs> to 440. Yep. That's not nice. No. <laughs> it's not and nice. He, those are some of the things. Um, there was a lot done to the hippies, but I want, I want to get into that by going into our 60s legacy, which was um, the effect upon those who were there, which I think is another proof to me or strong evidence that what it was was good and that it was not a um, a whole sigh up and that uh, I already said I don't think good that good can come from evil evil fears good it doesn't it cannot create good but when I looked at it and I said wow I really started to look at this and I said this is some strong evidence because we had such that we despite all of the suppression of things and some of it was I believe done with uh, there was like a strong back to the land movement that grew out of the 60s uh, there's a I'm jumping around, but there was a, there's a criticism that the hippies don't didn't do nothing. That that that's one of the biggest criticisms of the '60s is that we 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 weren't militant enough, and we didn't like go to the CIA and or to go to the Pentagon and make them stop the war. And uh, just like they say now, it's like why don't you go? You know, we should all organize into a giant crowd and go to NASA and demand you know the answers to what they're doing. But there is a positive effect that came out of the 60s that I wasn't even aware of until I started to gather it, and I actually participate in some of this, but the Back to the Land movement was one of them. The the proliferation of communes, a lot of that was, was chopped down by, I think, the CIA tried to stop that because it was a major effort. At one point, I believe there was 10,000 communes uh, in the early 70s. But uh, I think that even today, there's still a good uh, intentional community uh, 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 movement, but it's much more anemic now. And I think it was cut out by, by all the vigorous zoning laws that they're still enforcing like crazy. So the point, my point being, as I come to this list of things, they're actually all being attacked now in real time but they're still there and they came out of the 60s and they're part and parcel to the natural man woman movement and they're relevant today and 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 they they should insp it should inspire us it should inspire us uh to believe that we can do have done are creative and um we should stand tall and 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 gather around these institutions like alt community, alternative community, communes, eco villages, and co housing. These don't have to be rural. They all they all have urban counterparts. It's not like I said, not about grass and trees. And the, the the homesteading movement, the organic and biodynamic gardening and farming. These can all be traced back to that time. Community gardening, farmers markets, the proliferation of buying co ops. Permaculture even can go back to that. Magazines like Whole Earth Catalog and Mother Earth News came out of there. Uh, alternative education either started there or was greatly, um, as, as the hippies had children, Waldorf schools, homeschooling came out of there. Uh, Montes the growth of Montessori and, our, and charter schools all have their roots there. Uh, it goes into building and design, energy, uh, 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 off-grid and solar, ecology, their first Earth Day, Greenpeace, recycling, and a lot of the uh, different kinds of roots music that are around, uh, the resurgence of vinyl records and analog tape recording, uh, alternative medicine, uh, the many kinds of, of, of that growth, the growth of retreat and renewal centers, like Harbin Hot Springs, which actually burned to the ground last year in California. That started in 72, but there are a lot of others. And gatherings like the Rainbow Family of Light, Burning Man Festival, grassroots festivals, as opposed to arena shows. All of this is our legacy. Uh, the even Bitcoin and, and Ithaca dollars and barter and online festival art and craft selling is all part of this counterculture and its children. Yeah, that's a great list, Carl. It's really interesting because I read through that when you had sent your outline over to me and I was reading through it and I thought to myself, he's absolutely right. <laughs> we have uh, basically we're circling back to that, Yeah. to those list of things today. Or we're trying to. And, and the thing is, 
the controllers, the apparatus, the controlling apparatus, is trying to keep us from going to those things. Yes, they are. Colorado just just allowed finally you can you can you can gather up to 110 gallons of water off your roof. Before that, it was actually in the law that the state owns the rainwater. Yeah, that, the water that falls from the sky is owned by the state. The state. Yeah. that's a direct affront to what I just all those things I just named. Exactly, it's a direct affront to humanity. I mean, yeah, to the saying, natural I, I own man. The, I own the rain. Somebody owns yeah. the rain. Yeah. It's it's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. Right. I think the the biggest thing they did was is the zoning laws and also I think that they actually created the 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 materialistic society of the me generation, the consumer society with the proliferation of credit cards. This was all part of it too, was to head off this back to the land movement and this back to our natural selves of our, our garden. But that is where we need to go today because I saw a great, I wish I could reference it, but the, it shows that in history, withstanding the tumult of changes in the historical cycle, and we're in sort of a collapse right now, even though people are awakening, we're in a great uh, movement of uh, change, of change. And what's withstood that the most was when people, historically, is when people have been able to work together and support each other in small communities and, and produce their food and, and help each other and help, and, and that's what's, what's worked. So we can see that as networking. We don't have to form communes. We don't have to all have to go on communes. But those those are the kinds of things that I believe are important. No, I would agree. I would Even agree. the Hopi are saying the time of the lone wolf is over. I mean, you can look at the Hopi uh, uh, prophecies, and, and, and this is, you know, create your – Here's a w- one little bit from one. Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other, and do not look outside yourself for your leader. But that's all part and parcel for what's needed today. But I, 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 I do want to just champion our, ourselves and not and, and 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 again speak. I feel I feel like there is a case for saying that it was good, that it was ours. And that we should not let the dark side rewrite any history that tries to make us small or to suggest that we are powerless. If I go back to the one chart where you talk about the alt community, the food, the education, the the alternative buildings and designs, energy, ecology, health and well-being, those are all things today that existed back in the 1960s or were being fostered and promoted in the 1960s that are being completely squelched today. Yeah. Completely squelched. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't want you having uh, any homeschooling. They don't want you utilizing alternative medicine. I was reading something recently. This this pops up every once in a while. Over the last couple of years, I want to say I've, I've probably seen it three or four times, where they want to classify vitamin D as a medicine, as, as a prescription drug. <laughs> so to get vitamin D, because a lot of people today are vitamin D deficient, that's because people spend time indoors Plus, they spray the skies. Yeah. And uh, so can you imagine Can you imagine something that you get from the sunlight? It's like your example before where they, they turn around and say, we own the rainwater. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's yeah. craziness, you know? Yeah. So, but uh, some, some very, very good points. So what do we do moving forward? It's unknown. It's unknown what the future is exactly, except that all evidence, all prophecy, all, all uh, view shows that we're heading into a time of great change and, 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 and challenge. Um, and there should be discussion about what to do about it there is discussion and some and 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 there's a lot of varying dis, uh, discussion about it whether whether action or whether it's we're too late and we just need to that's what i think is that we just need to batten down the hatches right now uh because and and survive is what we need to do yeah i see with a lot of the uh, the masses today lethargy i mean i, I see there's an apathy that didn't exist in the 1960s I yeah. Mean, as an example, if we, we take a look at the, the colleges and the universities in the 1960s, I mean, they were a lot more reactive to things. Oh, 
yeah. Right? And today... They, they were the hotbed, or they were one of the hotbeds of, of what was going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and people could argue it was good, it was bad, or whatever, you know. But the, the point being is there was a movement to affect a, a cause, and people weren't afraid to get up out of their seats or out of their chairs and say, you know what, I'm going to stand up for this. Yeah. Today, you don't have that. I mean, you go to the college campuses today, and you know this, Carl. I, I know I'm, I'm you know, preaching to the choir here. I mean, these kids are just hunkered down staring at their phones. Well, yeah. They don't know anything. They don't right. know anything. They don't know anything that's going on in the world. Yeah. And if you try to tell them, they do not care. They don't care. Right. But we're talking about the awakened people because the vast majority have been co-opted. Yeah. You're right. It's That's different from the 60s. That's different than the 60s. That's my point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We we're 50 years advanced and we've had the effects of the degradation of the food and the television and all the rest. Right. That's right. Right. So we're years. speaking to the awakened. Uh, there isn't enough uh, uh, critical mass to affect the change and we, and we need to batten down the hatches and survive. Yeah. Yeah. These are very interesting times we live in. Very, v very interesting. Very, times, you know. but my my advice to people is the same that I'm giving myself now because I've taken it on the chin. I've given it to myself on the chin because the more that I look, the more crestfallen I become. Uh, so uh, I finally come to the point where really one needs to be of good cheer and 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 maintain one's space one's attitude one has to even in the face of it and it isn't a matter of denial because you, you could point to people that say that are, you would say they were in la la land i'm not going to look at that you do have to look at it and this is all metaphysical it's another show but d denial is death it's not a matter of the good cheer has to be in the face of it not in denial of it yeah yeah and right. uh, and and that allows you to step another way out of the matrix basically and and find others like yourself and i know it isn't easy these days to do that but we have to continue to try to find others like ourselves because the time of purification is coming and it isn't going to work too well to be a lone wolf uh, and 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 to maintain your health you have to be of good cheer you in the face of it these are very, very strange times. They're very exciting times. If we can just touch a few more people, Carl, just doing the work that you do, your research and the work that I'm doing, just to get people to wake up, you know, to, to take that red pill and stop swallowing that blue pill all the time, uh, we could start making a change. And But it's a difficult road ahead. People ask me all the time. They say, well, Mike, you know, what do you think? You think we're going to be able to turn this ship around? you know, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. I'm I'm not so sure, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here, but look, I'm 57 years old, so I, I don't know in my lifetime if we're going to be able to turn this around. But it's almost irrelevant because we have to pursue the truth and we have to continue to set the table for future generations. Yeah. We have a responsibility yeah. as humans to do these things. It's right. irresponsible to do nothing. It's irresponsible to be in denial. It's irresponsible to be apathetic. It's irresponsible to be ignorant about your containment and how you're being controlled. And I, I think that people need to step out. And, uh, and and the thing is, Carl, and you know this, once you do become awake and you do become aware of this apparatus that's around us, you can never go back. Yeah. You cannot go back. You cannot say, you know what? I, I liked it better the way it was. So I'm just going to go back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once you're out, you're out, folks. You're out. Right. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, it is going to become increasingly uh, important for us each as individuals to chart our path to make yeah. the right decisions because it is getting more and more intense. Yeah, it is getting intense. You can see that they're putting the the pedal to the metal. They're they're going these balls to the wall now. I mean, yeah. And this is because they know people are becoming more alert, more awake. You know, one of the things with this whole circus with the election and everything else, the one thing, though, that's coming out of it uh, is that people who were completely asleep, now they're beginning to wake up a little yeah. bit. Because now they're looking at what's going on and they're seeing the, the level of corruption. And well, seeing, yeah. As, yeah. As the dark side becomes more visible, then all of those who can awaken will awaken. Right. 
it's coming out now. The dark side is coming out now. The truth is coming out now. It's almost almost ordained by the stars, uh, or I don't know, for lack of better words. But as the dark reveals itself, those who look, can awaken will. Right. And that's what's happening. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Well, Carl, I just want to say that uh, it was an uh, excellent discussion. I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad that uh, you decided to come on the show and talk about this because it is a viewpoint that uh, is not being expressed. There is this overriding, overarching attempt to revise history in general. And the 1960s and what the 60s meant, like every every time period has its ups and its downs, it's, it's good and it's bad. But there was a lot of good that was happening in the 1960s. And the fact now that there's this effort to, to douse that flame and put it out and say, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't good at all. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that we doesn't can, serve us. Yeah, it doesn't, exactly. It doesn't and it serve isn't us. true. And it isn't true. Yeah. So, well, all right, Mike, I, I certainly appreciate it. I, I had a good time. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Great. Thanks, right, Mike. Carl, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laborofloveMusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.